Hi, Book Warriors. Thank you Hi. so much for joining us tonight. We've got Lawrence Kelter here. Yay! Yay! And you might notice there's someone sitting behind beside me too. <laughs> and she poured me a nice big whiskey. This is my friend Carol, and she is a writer too. She's a songwriter. She was poet laureate of her college. So she's a, a word person too and a former teacher. And, and interestingly enough, she has a connection to my cousin Vinny that we'll talk about um, soon too. But thanks so much for joining us, Larry. Of course, we know Lawrence Kelter is Larry. Uh, Misa and I know him from our Sisters in Crime chapter in the Triad region of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you'll be able to tell from Larry's accent that he's not a North Carolina native. <laughs> oh, come on. Nobody would have ever figured that out. <laughs> so, Larry, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about you and your background and, and uh, how you started writing, that kind of thing? Oh, my God. I mean, um, sure. Okay. It wasn't one of the questions, so I'm not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> it's always more coming from the author, I think. You know, okay. Well, I've been I've been writing for a good twenty years. Um, I've always wanted to do, to do some writing. I didn't know what shape or form it would take, and um, um, you know I would I would tinker around with it. You know um, I think if you, if you want to write, you're going to do it one way or another. Um, I've heard stories where Elmore Leonard used to write before he went to his day job. He'd go into the office early and he'd. Um, scribbles, you know, scribble down on a legal pad, and then the bin, you know, a nine o'clock bell would ring. He'd put his legal pad away, and he'd become an insurance agent. You know, mm -hmm. in the days before he became famous. Um, I had a sim I have a similar story, although I never became famous. Um, <laughs> You're famous in our eyes. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted I wanted to write, and I really have a terrible handwriting, so I, I tried. You know, with a legal pad, I you know I lived in Long Island at the time, and I would commute on the Long Island Railroad. You know, two and a half hours every day, going in and out from out of the city. Oh wow! Um, and this was in the days before um, laptop computers, so I bought one of those Smith Corona portable word processors, and it was like walking around with a billiard table. Um, <laughs> I this, I'm gonna have to pause frequently to drink because. Yeah, Whenever Larry up. drinks, we need to drink. Uh, that might be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so I had one of those big carrying cases. You know, remember the days of the old video recorders where you had these monstrosities? Well, this was a monstrosity, and I would get on the Long Island Railroad with this this workbench, um, squeeze in between two other commuters, and start typing away. Wow. And I type my first book commuting into New York and, and back to Long Island. Um, and I was, I guess, in the you know, late 1990s or early 2000s. And, um, you know, I think if you talk with enough writers or go to enough book conferences, you'll see everybody's got a similar story in terms of, you know, I just really wanted to do it and I didn't have time for it. So I just, we made it happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was a story for a long time. <laughs> Bottoms up. <laughs> be Nate, be Nate. I don't think uh, I ever heard what brought you to North Carolina. Also oh. not on our question list. Okay. Well, that, that's the short answer. The short answer is family and grandchildren. Um, I have four grandkids down here. Uh, my son, daughter-in-law, and, and the grandkids moved from California, um, which was... Um, a ridiculously expensive place to try to buy a house when you have a big family. So they moved down here and we followed them down. Um, I'm frozen. Look at that. Can you, was my voice frozen also or just my video? You're not frozen to us. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, to me, it looks like I have a stiff neck. <laughs> <coughs> uh, we want to point out that Larry is, is getting over COVID, still suffering from COVID. He got it at Malice Domestic last weekend, so... Oh, we're glad he now. didn't cancel on us. But oh, you, you shouldn't say I got it a Malice Domestic because now we're going to get sued. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he got it from someone while he was attending Malice Domestic. Or some, in some nebulous location at some nebulous time. <laughs> un, undisclosed. Oh, I'm, not, um, I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming whoever brought it in. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I started writing uh, in the early 2000s and... Um, Again, analogous stories to a lot of authors out there. I wrote my first book. Um, I sent it to an agent. Well, actually, I sent it probably to 100 agents. 
but you know, I got I got a good reaction to it, and um, first book was picked up by Writer's House, and I said, oh my God, this is it, you know, I am, you know, I'm the next Hemingway, you know. <laughs> Right, that's what every writer thinks when you know they get some quick acceptance on their uh, on their work. And um, don't close, uh, don't, yeah, don't close your eyes. The first book in the Stephanie Chalice series was published in two thousand five, and it's lived nothing but turmoil since then. <laughs> <laughs> we feel your pain. <laughs> so, um, can you tell us specifically how the Vinnie books came about? I can. Would you like me to? Yes, I would like you to. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, are you grammar Nazi? <laughs> <laughs> okay. May you? May you? Yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah. Please you. tell us. Please <laughs> tell us. Oh, okay, I will tell you. <laughs> Boy, you really don't have. You really could use a little more to drink. I know. Right? <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so. Um, I've always been a, a big fan of the movie. I'm from Brooklyn originally. Um, you can probably tell that I have something of a New York accent, although I, I don't think I really sound Brooklynese, but I've always been a, a tremendous fan of the movie. It came out in 1992, and it was the kind of thing that if it was playing at any time on any television and I was in the vicinity, there goes my afternoon, or there went my afternoon. And that's what happened in... 2015 or 16, something like that. Um, I was in the den flipping through the TV channels and my cousin Vinny is on. And as soon as you hear, yeah, you blend, that's it. <laughs> I, you know, I'm sunk. I'm going to sit there for the next two hours and watch that movie, even if a nuclear bomb is going off outside. Um, and I did. And at the end of the movie, I turned to my wife and I said, you know, writing is such a, uh, a lonely profession for most people. Um, you know, the uh, you know the whole concept of a writer is somebody at a you know a keyboard in a closed room, you know, with no noise or whatever. I said, you know, this guy does probably doesn't get a lot of acclaim anymore. The movie is over twenty years old. I'm gonna give him a pat on the back. I'm gonna let him know that. Um, well, after 20 years, I'm still laughing my butt off over this movie. And, you know, uh, because I'm aging, my brain cells are dying off. And every joke is like, it's new to me. Um, so I did that. I wrote off, I found this email. I sent them an email. By the way, I'm still frozen on the screen here. So I can't tell what no, I look you're like. Moving. I have it on my, on my phone. You're moving. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I look up um, the screenwriter's information. His name is Dale Warner. And um, uh, I sent him off an email and I said to my wife, well, that's it. I did my job. You know, my, you know, my conscience is clear. I wanted to give the man a pat on the back. I did that. And uh, I'm not going to hear back. You know, he's a Hollywood screenwriter. I'm a guy from Brooklyn. You know, I'm dirt beneath his boots. So, you know, whatever. I, I feel good about myself. And sure, sure enough, within, I don't know, probably 20 minutes or a half an hour, an email pops up from Dale Warner, and it's not like, thank you very much, go take a hike. It's like, hey, how would you like to know what's going on? He wrote me a tome, you know, a long, lengthy email about the making of the movie, what he's doing these days. And we started um, talking over email, and um, emails <laughs> led, to, led to conversations. And, uh, you know, he's a very interesting guy. Um, uh, like most successful people, he had a, you know, I, I don't know if he's listening in, he had a massive ego and <laughs> he, you know, he found somebody to share it with. So he was telling me all about his projects and, uh, the making of the movie. Um, and you know, it seemed like he was, you know, he was happy to talk. He said, you know what, you want to hear what I'm working on now? And I said, sure. And all of a sudden I hear the crinkling paper He goes, all right, page one. <laughs> fade in you know and he starts reading me his newest screenplay and, you know so we got you know um kind of friendly um and he had all these stories to tell me about the movie which at this point you can probably pick up in dribs and drabs all over the internet through um you know movie talk or imdb or you know any um 
any uh, more recent interviews, but he had all kinds of interesting things to tell me about the movie um, and the characters that you would have no idea from watching a, you know, a 90 minute film. Um, for example, uh, and this is the thing that shocked me the most, um, Marissa Tomei is so great in that movie. She won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. And it uh, turns out that the studio wanted to cut her out of the movie. Wow. Uh, they were watching the dailies, and at some point they called him up and they said, Dale, come into the studio. Or, and he, um, he said, what's up? And he says, well, you know what? They're not really digging this too much. Um, she's got some good lines. Why don't you give them to Vinny and, and eliminate her role in the movie? And he was like, you know, he, he flips out. He says, you know, you can't do that. She's great in the movie. You know, she's instrumental to the, to the story. Um, so he said, all right, well, if you don't want to cut her out, then go beef up her part. And he went home and he wrote the scene where she's on the porch in the cat suit and a biological clock is ticking. <laughs> that scene, which is one of the, probably one of the top two or three scenes in the movie, wasn't originally scripted. It was just added so that she wouldn't be cut out of the movie. You know, and I, I was just floored by that. That's wow. crazy. Yeah, a lot of lot of interesting things that you know, um, you know, going on behind the scenes that um, you know, impossible to pick up on. Um, one of the things that came up uh, even before he he and I agreed to do a, a book series was the fact that he didn't see Vinny as Joe Pesci. He didn't see um, Vinny as a, you know, a cute little tough guy. <laughs> he, he, um, he saw Vinny as, a, as an ex-pugilist, uh, more of a Rocky Balboa type. Oh. Um, bigger, more intimidating, um, little punch drunk maybe. He didn't see him as, as the character that Joe Pesci um, uh, portrayed. As a matter of fact, he had a list of people he had in mind for the role. None of them were Joe Pesci. Um, his, his first pick was, um, uh, believe it or not, was, oh my God, what's his name? Um, Sloan? Andrew, what? Sloan? Sloan? It wasn't Sloan, no, no. It wasn't, um, Andrew Dice Clay was his first pick uh, to be Vinny. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, because you can, right? Because you can see, you know, Andrew Dice Clay is a guy from New Jersey. He's you know, he's a big, you know, intimidating guy. He could be um, a bag man for the mob, that kind of thing. And the studio didn't want him. And then he wanted um, De Niro. And this is before De Niro was doing comedy. De Niro hadn't done Analyze This and Analyze That, which is probably the, which were probably the two movies that kicked off his, his comedy career. And the studio said, De Niro doesn't do comedy. He's a dramatic actor. So they, you know, so they they shelved the De Niro idea. They went through another one or two, and Joe Pesci was really not on their hit list. But um, no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> no. But Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Al Pacino was not is not on the uh, not on the list. He would have been what on my an, list. I love Pacino. What an entirely different film it would have been with any of those other actors. Yeah, but I think it would have been way more stereotypical, don't you? Like, I think Joe <laughs> Pesci did it, you know, kind of, it was kind of a different take. It wasn't as stereotypical, probably. It probably was not. I mean, there's a, you know, you can see on the screen, and as he intended, there's a big age discrepancy uh, between um, Vinny and Lisa. Um, he actually has a, Dale actually had a number in mind, 13 years old. 13 years difference. He, um, um, in his mind, when they first met, Lisa was not even 18 years old, mm -hmm. and Vinny was about 31. Mm -hmm. um, and in his mind, his, his, his prequel, if you will, um, he has the meeting. I can explain the circumstances, you know, at another point during the interview. But he's a gentleman, and he won't he won't go to bed with her because she's not 18 yet. So. <laughs> anyway, make of it what you will. That, that that would fly just absolutely fine 15 years ago, maybe, but not now. <laughs> yeah. It's a little too dicey, too sketchy. So with you doing the books, though, how how exactly did that happen? You, you Did you propose it? Did they propose it? I'm sure people want to know how that kicked okay. off. Okay. 
So in the you know I, I call this the uh, the Lorna tapes. You know we we're talking and talking and talking. He's going through his projects. He's telling me about his movies, his successes, and like I said, the guy has a pretty substantial ego. <laughs> but um, in the conversations, of course, I asked. I said, you know, so my cousin Vinny, it's so beloved. Why no sequel? And he says, well, there was a sequel. I wrote a sequel. The studio didn't like it, so they had somebody rewrite my script, and they liked that even less, so they decided not to do it. And then a couple of years later, they came back to him and they said, well, you know, we still love my cousin Vinny. We don't want to do a sequel. Let's do a TV show. And, you know, we're thinking back to, you know, the mid-1990s. Um, think about the quality of television writing then as opposed, as opposed to what it is now. I mean, now you've got a million streaming services and some of the content is really excellent some of the writing is really excellent but going back to the mid 1990s you talk about manix and hawaii 50 mm -hmm. he said there's no way i'm going to entrust my two precious characters to a couple of garbage tv writers that was his basically his quote i'm paraphrasing but that was the point he was trying to get a, get across so the studio walked away from him on the sequel he walked away from them on the tv show he said, I always wanted them to have more of a, of a life, Finney and Lisa. I always saw them as a modern-day Nick and Nora, where Lisa would do the investigation, then Finney would take over and do the, um, the litigation. Did I get that mixed up? No, investigation, litigation. Yeah, right. right. She, uh, yeah, she was his assistant. Mm -hmm. Right. So I always saw more of a life for them than in you know, one movie. And I said, well, what do you think about a book series? And he said, you know, we, you know, we're getting along pretty well here. You know, I'm not pitching you on anything, so don't pitch me on anything. And he said, comedy today has, excuse me, evolved into something that I really detest. He says, if you watch comedies today, it's all, it's either stoner humor or it's this nausea. Again, this is not, these are not my words. I'm paraphrasing, but this is, the, you know, the, um, the content. It's all nauseating, sweetie pie, rom-com stuff. He says, I don't, I don't dig it. I don't want anybody else to do that to my characters. So we stopped talking about a project together, um, but he did, I did get him to um, read one of my books. And so I sent him a hard copy. And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, he called back and he said, you know what? He said, man, I, I read your books. You're pretty funny. <laughs> so, so we we you know we get started from there, um, and that was the really the easy part because the hard part was pursued when, you know, I had to find a lawyer. He, of course, being from Hollywood, he had a lawyer, and then the rights holder was 20th Century Fox, and they had a team of lawyers. So it got a little little sticky uh, and lengthy, but. Um, you know, he wanted to make it happen. I sure as hell wanted it to happen. So it did, it finally worked out. Well, we're glad it did. It was a hilarious book and, and we all enjoyed it. Carol's read the whole series. I oh, love okay. it. I just read uh, Benny, a very Vinny Christmas story. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I, I mean, you tied up the loose ends. I loved it. But I want you to write some more, okay? <laughs> I want to talk about Benny and Lisa. Christmas is coming. You know that. <laughs> well so now carol's got a connection this this reminds me of like the six degrees of kevin bacon there's like the six degrees of mm -hmm. Vinny. so carol can you tell tell everybody what your connection is to because of Vinny. yeah chris ellis who played jt you know the one with the ball cap oh you know who lisa beat in at uh pool uh is a dear very dear friend of mine from memphis uh, we worked together in several theater productions but um, he uh, he got the thing up for for my cousin. What, what am I saying? The word is getting me. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, he got the part of JT, which uh, spurred him on. To, uh, Joe Pesci helped him out. But uh, he was telling me. And I called him the other day and said, "Hey, I'm going to get to talk to an author, the one who wrote my cousin Benny. Tell me about my cousin Benny." He said, "You mean Dale Longner?" I said, "No, <laughs> you know." And I sent him the cover of the book, said that's by Lawrence Kelter. It was going. That's not who wrote my cousin Benny, and we got in a big argument. <laughs> <laughs> and then I 
looked back and looked at the first, the after the cover, the title page, whatever, and you, you, yeah, acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big word. Uh, and, I just don't hold that one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it said De, uh, to Dale Lawrence uh, Launder, who wrote the screenplay. I was like, right. oh, it. Now I have, oh, <laughs> sorry. Now I have to apologize. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> But anyway, uh -huh. drink us too. yeah, okay. <laughs> we don't have a swear jar, so might as well drink. <laughs> but anyway, he, um, he said Dale Lawner wrote the screenplay, and right. he, that had to be revised a lot because some nebulous person who was like a female uh, who won an Oscar or something, <laughs> I'm not saying anybody's name, but argued with Dale about her lines the whole time, was like, that's a stupid thing to say. And he said, well, what do you think she would say? And she said, I'm not the writer. You're the writer. You write it. <laughs> oh, that, no. Oh, all, really? All kinds of trouble with her. This but, might explain why they didn't want Marissa to write on the But movie. then at the very end, Chris said, the reason uh, that Dale Lawner stood at the rap party and said, the reason this film works so well is because of the chemistry between right. uh, Benny and Lisa. Mm -hmm. And because everyone in the and the story is a good guy except for one. And he pointed at Chris. He said, <laughs> JT, mm -hmm. how do you think about it? Uh, two guys from Brooklyn come down to Podunk, Alabama, and they're, they, they're seen on camera leaving a convenience store where the owner had been shot. You know, obviously, they're going to fry. You know, we get those Yankee boys. <laughs> so, uh, Seriously, but uh -huh. then every based on the evidence, everybody treats them fairly. And he said that's why the film works. It's uplifting. It's a good story. Everybody's a good guy except for JT. <laughs> well, I even felt like you know, kind of going back to the romance and, and back to Brooklyn. And this this is the the classic uh, cover. <laughs> Read down the covers and. Uh, but um, I liked that their relationship, that they're realistic with each other. You know, yeah. it's like, um, you know, she's, she's hot and ready to go. And he's like, mm -hmm. I'm tired. <laughs> you know? Right. Sometimes that's what happens. Yeah. And, you know, but they, they still love each other with their faults and, and they kind of really mesh really, really well. So, yeah. Really, and they're 13 really years apart. Although <laughs> they didn't get along off screen. No, oh, that's interesting. So before we continue, let's just take a second to welcome everybody. So Heather and Mary are here. Isabella. Oh, related to you, Larry. Is that your wife? Very closely. Okay. <laughs> so hello. Thank you for sharing. Uh, hey, Tracy. And of course, Carol. Um, Valerie, Dawn. Well, we have a great crowd tonight. So welcome, everybody. So glad that you could be here. Okay. Um, so I know you talked about that you've seen the movie so, so many times during the writing of each of these books. Mm -hmm. Did you go back to the movie to kind of keep those characters, you know, fresh in your mind and connected to what they were on the screen? Or did you kind of let them evolve on your own in your own way? I mean, there was definitely quite a bit of, um, of rewatching, um, the first book that was written is the sequel, Back to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And with Back to Brooklyn, I gave Dale a, um, uh, a, plot, a plot summary of where I wanted to take, you know, take the story. And um, he really didn't have much to comment about it other than he, he thought that Vinny needed to be congratulated for his, his tremendous work in Alabama. So that was his one point of, con you know, not contention, but his one uh, major assertion in the uh, in Back to Brooklyn was that there had to be a, a blowout party for Vinny because he such a, did such a great job. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen the movie so many times, you know, it's sort of on, you know, it was sort of on closed loop in my head. I was, yeah. you know, I could see the movie without seeing it. I could hear the dialogue without uh, listening to an audio. Uh, when I did the novelization of the um, of the movie, uh, at that point I was constantly watching and rewriting and looping, and I wanted to get everything as as precise as possible. So you know, it was almost like one of those um, 
TV detective shows where they're constantly fast forwarding and backing up and fast yeah. forwarding, backing up. I was doing that for days and days with that one book, but not with the others. Yeah. You know, um, you know, one of the things that I, I tried to do and hopefully I did a good job was maintain their voice. Um, a lot of people who have read the book have told me that they can actually hear Vinny or Joe Pesci talking to Marissa yeah. Pome as they're reading the book. Um, one of the things that was critical to Dale was that the, um, you know, their relationship always has a little playful edge to it, that it's a playful cat and mouse thing. It's not really adversarial. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at it and, you know, you don't really have a feel for it, you're going to say, oh, they're always fighting. They're always bickering. She's always trying to one-up him or he's trying to put her down. And that's not the case. They're just, that's just the way they interact. That's just mm -hmm. their personal cat and mouse chemistry. Um, so it was important to kind of toe the line on that so that they're, they're going at it, but they're having fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mm -hmm. never found it respectful. I thought it was just sort of like, cut the crap, here's, you know, and, and kind of pointing out things that maybe, you know, we, we all have things we're not aware of about ourselves. And I felt like they kind of did that with each other. They sort of kind of went, well, this is what's really happening. <laughs> or, you know, it, yeah, I never thought it felt felt that way to me but, and that was one thing I actually kind of liked is they were just you know very honest with each other and, and neither one mm -hmm. took it too personally or you know blew it out of proportion or anything. well you've kind of maybe even kind of answered our next question was was about um how the humor in the movie was really tied to Vinny's character and Lisa was you know has all those like, complexities you know she knows all that stuff about cars and Vinny has this unique twist on the law which reminds me a lot <laughs> of Saul and in, in Better Call Saul oh yeah right. yeah that, you know, he's of course Saul's a little more, you know, scary and 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 stuff, uh, a little more outside mm -hmm. the. Um, is there any other research you had to do? I mean, you've kind of talked about watching the movie a lot, but was there any other research that you needed to do? Yeah, before? cars and law, because Lisa, with her knowledge of cars and all of that, which was you know so fun yeah. in the in the first. Um, I learned movie. about cars. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, in terms of cars, I am from Brooklyn. I mean, you know, I did my what? own. Tune-ups, oil changes, carburetors. I did all that. St I did everything Vinny Lisa could do. Although it's a little cuter when she says it. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was kind of the, the life I lived. Um, you know, I was the kid, you know, lying under the car in the middle of the street, changing the oil, you know, greasing the joints. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I have a pretty good knowledge of, of cars, you know, particularly muscle cars, you know. Um, so that would, that part wasn't too hard for me. I wanted to come up, you know, with parallel situations. And of course, you know, who could touch, you know, you know, a 1963 Bonneville with positive traction or whatever it is. I mean, that is, you know, that was done so well. So I, I had to do a bunch of research to try to come up with similar um, witticisms, if you will, uh, related to cars, but not copying, you know, those classic classic lines that Dale Lorna had uh, had written into the script. Yeah. What about uh, the law? The, the law. <laughs> you know, you kind of stole my thunder because I didn't go to law school, but I, I did watch five seasons of Better Call Saul. So <laughs> that's all I need. Um, I'm eminently qualified. Um, I did talk to you know. I did talk to quite a few lawyers. I mean, you know, you talk, call up a lawyer and you say, you know, I'm writing the sequel to My Cousin Vinny. Do you have anything to say? And, you know, you're on the phone for three days. <laughs> um, I did did a bunch of interviews. I did a bunch of um, um, internet research. Um, I even interviewed a, a state Supreme Court um, justice. I um, was lucky enough to get a couple hours time with this guy and... Uh, I mean, you know, very talkative, you know, you know, about their careers, their history, their cases. Um, the, the Supreme Court justice I spoke with actually had so much to say. He gave me the, the material for another book, um, not not my cousin of any book, but another book that I did write um, and publish. Um, it's called Fallen City. And I co-wrote that with a friend of ours, Frank Zafiro. I, Diane knows him. Um, 
And this, it all came from this two hour meeting with uh, the state support, state Supreme Court justice. Um, right, it's always nice when you get a, an extra takeaway from an interview like that, you know. Oh yeah, the freebie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and that much time with the lawyer on their dime. Yeah, I know, I'm surprised nobody tried to bill me for that time. <laughs> I got an interesting story if you when um, uh, Back to Brooklyn was published, um, the publisher got a call from the Trial Lawyers Association who was having their annual meeting in Florida um, in January several years ago and they said, you know, would Larry consider, um, you know, coming to the Trial Lawyers Conference and addressing the Trial Lawyers and oh, I said, wow. well, I said, this is, you know, this is ridiculous, but sure, why not, we'll sell some books. Um, so I get down there, it was a very nice hotel in South Beach, and um, they tell me, you know, show up at, you know, conference room or ballroom, whatever, at a certain time, um, 15 minutes before the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so I do it, you know, I'm punctual, right? I was, you know, had my material ready, I was dressed up, ready to go, uh, I show 15 minutes early. And the head lawyer there says to me, there's going to be a little bit of a delay. I hope you don't mind. I said, no, I'm okay. You know, you need a few minutes, take a few minutes. He says, yeah. I said, F. Lee Bailey just stopped by and he would like to talk to the group. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, if F. Lee Bailey wants to talk to the lawyers, I guess there's not much I can do about it. And oh, <clears> upstage. <throat> I was a little bit, you know, upstage to say the least. So they said, I'll help you on for 10 minutes. He's got a little canned speech he wants to make. Terrific. I'm good for 10 minutes. One hour later, this guy is still talking to the trial lawyers. This other attorney is coming to me apologizing every five minutes. They can't get him off the stage, you know. It's like they need the hook to yank him off the stage. He won't <laughs> stop talking. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with F. Lee Bailey's career, but he, you know, is not really held in fine and in high regard uh, towards the end of his career. And he was, I think he'd been disbarred. <laughs> like Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> Something like that. Um, his whole, the whole reason for being there in a, in a veiled, um, presentation was he was trying to recruit attorneys to take his course um, so he was just like pouring it on for 55 60 minutes about how important it would be for them to sign up for his trial lawyers course and right. once they took his course they would be the quintessential trial attorneys oh, um, <laughs> so I, I sat there while he gave an hour sales pitch and then I finally you know went on <laughs> I think they, they were relieved to see the guy dragged off stage. <laughs> That's a true story. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, so moving <clears throat> on, we have Lisa, Mona Lisa, who becomes a bit of an environmentalist. I'm curious how that came to be. The toilet paper scene was pretty funny. Okay. Well, <clears throat> when I wrote that scene, um, I didn't really see Lisa um being a hero to the environment i think what i'm trying to portray is that lisa's got a strong sense of what's right and what's proper uh whether she's protecting the environment or just advocating to do the right thing and um you know it, Vinny is just you know he's so quirky and you know he's kind of self uh <laughs> self-focused and you know wasting toilet paper or toilet paper rolls would never even dawn on him but lisa's you know got this you know this moral compass and she's saying you know you're not doing anything for the planet by you know by wasting toilet paper you know yeah. but it wasn't uh, it wasn't strictly that she's an environmentalist or um she's trying to save the planet i think she's just trying to do the right thing well uh, they can't, they have more uh I think you did a great job of just giving them complexity, just kind of, you know, expanding on the idea of, of her having more to her than right. we were able to see certainly in the movie, which is cool because we get to see the evolution of them as characters. Right. Well, you know, I had 
to do something because, you know, in the original movie, you know, he's the quintessential fish out of water. Right. Every time he talks to somebody, he's banging heads or he's he's wrong on every account just because he's, you know, so um, the environment is so strange for him. So, yeah, I mean, I had to give them more weight as individuals, so to speak. Um, you know, in order to maintain the comic flow. I mean, you know, Finney is a fish out of water no matter where he goes. <laughs> well, yeah, because the courtroom scenes where the judge got mad about, you know, you look at me. Don't be looking down when you're right. things. And don't say the dims and the all that that kind of stuff. But yeah, <laughs> I, I noticed that too, is that, that one, the whole theme when when um, Lisa's talking about, you know, the fish, the, the, it's supposed to be crab, but it's really this fish milkshake and all that. Her oh. whole thing was like, you know, people aren't always what they appear. You know, people might be tempted to uh, look at Teresa Cotati and say, oh, well, she's just a stripper. Of course she killed somebody. And it's like, well, no, she's she may be a stripper, but she doesn't sleep around. She's been faithful to this guy. So right. kind of, just, you know, getting deeper and getting more into the individuals and, and you know, not just surface level. So it's kind of like and, you can enjoy the Breaking stereotypes. Like yeah, breaking stuff. Yeah, yeah, that so. too. Well, I mean, that's that's part of part of our job, right? As writers, to lead people one direction, you know, let their impulses, let their wanton thinking seep into the picture, <laughs> so that they're drawing the wrong conclusion on their own. Um, you know, I guess that's probably what I was I was doing with that. Well, you did a good job of doing it, but not not making it feel like we were being brought down or like it didn't it didn't feel out of place or like, oh, this dark moment in an otherwise light book. It was still still funny, but it, it just it flowed really, really well. It was just kind of like, oh, okay, there's there's more to these people. And yeah, I thought that was that was really well done. So um well you've kind of talked about this about your legal background. Um, you know my non-legal background? <laughs> yeah, your legal background. So <laughs> You know, maybe we go on to the next question. Should I ask the next one? Then? Yeah, we kind of right. we kind of did number six also about the fish out of water, um, the humor, you know, of, of how that. So why don't we jump ahead to number seven? Seven. OK, so how did you discover that you are funny? Did you set out to write funny books or did that just happen? Me? I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I. <clears throat> That's a question for Isabella. <laughs> funny in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know. Okay. I mean, I, I've always been told I have a, a kind of a dry sense of humor. When I started writing, um, I don't know if you've read any of the Stephanie Chalice books, but it's a little very tongue in cheek. Um, you know, that's just me. You know, a little, little bit sarcastic, a little bit cynical. Um, <laughs> and yeah, now, I, try, now, I try to rein it in a little bit. What? Is it Chalice or Chalisi? It's Chalisi. It's definitely Chalisi. Um, but Chalice is how it's spelled, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Most people will look at a cover and say Stephanie Chalice. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, I try to crack myself up. I, <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy writing funny stuff. Sometimes, you know, that's a big editing challenge because I'll throw so much, so many one-liners into a book that, you know, I don't want to take them out, but Ultimately, you have to you have to find comb them out. But don't you feel like if you've made yourself laugh or cry, you know that that's some good writing right there. Hopefully, but yeah. if you laugh when you read it again when you're editing, you're like, I still think that's funny, and I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah, I still right. think yeah. it was coming or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's part of the writing process. You know what I, you know, one of the things I do, and not to cut out cut out another question because I know that's a question for later on. No, um, go ahead. <laughs> Excuse me. So tell us about your writing process. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Boy, that was a clumsy segue. Huh? <laughs> oh, and your wife answered, he really is funny, a dry sense of humor. So yay. <laughs> there you go. Validation. Like the, the dating game. You both got it right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very funny. You know, I just came back from Malice. And, you know, when I go there, I love, um, you know, attending. <laughs> I'm sorry? What? Malice or Malisi? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Diane. <laughs> it's definitely Malice. Sorry. Okay. But, um, <laughs> okay. Tell who's the more experienced drinker. 
you guys are getting a little punchy. Okay, yeah, what tell okay. us about your uh, writing process. Yeah, so I mean, you know, in listening to writers talk, because inevitably questions come off on every panel, you know, especially if you're, there, you know, a, a name is being interviewed. Um, you know, what's your writing process? Are you a plotter? Are you a pantser? Are you a this? Are you that? And I think it's funny that everybody I've listened to over the years, we all have very analogous um, uh, processes. I mean, I'm, I call myself a hybrid writer because I do a little bit of plotting, a little bit of seat of, you know, seat of the pants writing. Um, um, and I've written a lot of books. So I, you know, the percentage of which way that swings varies from book to book. Um, do you set a schedule and, you know, you're sitting down at your desk every day for a certain, or do you have like a word count for the day or what's that part of your process like? Um, I'm not as disciplined as I used to be now that I'm getting older and lazier. <laughs> um, but, you know, for the most part, yeah, I would try to put in a full day. Um, you know, I spent my entire life uh, working in an office in the city. Um, got up, took a seven o'clock train into the city, got home, you know, 7.45, eight o'clock at night. I was used to sitting at a desk for many, many hours a day. And I tried to maintain that same kind of structure where I just, you know, got up, had a cup of coffee and went, went to work. And, excuse me. <laughs> I, you know, I would feel guilty, you know, if I took time off, you know, if, um, you know, if instead of, you know, running downstairs for a quick sandwich, if I said, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm sick and tired of sitting in a house, I'll go out to a restaurant and order something, you know, just have a change of pace, just to, you know, to speak with somebody other than, you know, talking to the four walls. Um, but now, as I said, I'm not as disciplined as I used to be, but I, I always did try to put in, you know, a good, you know, six, seven, eight hour day of writing time. Yeah. That's impressive because that can be really hard to do. If you, especially if you're not a, a a very detailed plotter. At least I run into that problem. If you're not a very detailed plotter, sometimes it's hard to push forward. I agree with you a hundred percent. And there are there are times when it's really not flowing. Um, um, but I subscribe to the rule that you you know you're just better off putting something down as opposed to not putting anything down. And sure, you may come back in the second, you know, in the revision or, you know, second revision and say, you know, I wasn't sure about this when I wrote it. When I read it, the, when I edited it the first time, I still wasn't sure about it. Now I'm sure it stinks. So, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, I'm just getting more hydration here. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I firmly believe you have to have a goal. I don't really have a word goal. Um, there are people who feel you just put too much emphasis on a number of words. I mean, you can have a great day and write 500 words and have a lousy day and write 3000 words. And, you know, I'm on Facebook every day for, for a duration. And you just see all these writers saying, yippee, 5,000 words, yippee, 6,000 words. And it's like, okay, but you know, what are you saying with 6,000 words? I can write 6,000 words, you know, um, you know, the old uh, scenario about putting enough chimpanzees behind typewriters and they'll come up with more in peace. I mean, yeah, you can pump out a lot of words, but, you know, are they are you moving, advancing the story? Are they quality words, mm -hmm. you know, or are you just pumping out words because you have a word count total? I'm not a, not a big, you know, I don't really subscribe to a word count total. Yeah. I just like try to be productive. Would make my brain hurt <laughs> to be too many words like that. <laughs> that would just make my brain hurt whenever I have days where I write a, a lot, a lot, a lot more than usual. I just, I'm so exhausted by the end of the day. I couldn't sustain that day after day after day. Yeah. Larry, your wife just said you were just in a panel at Malice about right. lawyers and law. Right. I saw your posts on that. It was funny. Yeah. I think I was the only one there who wasn't a lawyer. I don't know <laughs> why they stuck me on that panel. I think for comic relief. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. I, well, I was a paralegal for a while. So I you were? College. She yeah. was a Lisa. <laughs> I was a Lisa. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's interesting, though. That was the first time I heard that um, that Marissa Tomei was uh, was a prima donna on the set. I didn't know that. Yeah. I... <laughs> bleep, bleep, bleep. 
I'm going to choose not to believe that because I like her. Yeah. I mean, uh, I didn't mention her name. I just said nebulous person. Female person. <laughs> she who must not be named. So, so we've talked about um, your interaction with lawyers a little bit. And then Isabella just brought up the panel. Have you gotten any criticism or lawyers saying you didn't get that right or can't do that or anything like that? I really didn't have not gotten a lot of um, criticism as far as... Um, uh, legal legal um, mistakes. Um, one lawyer wrote to me on Twitter and said, "I read your book. That was a lot of fun. You did you play kind of fast and loose with law, but you know, <laughs> he said it's my cousin Vinny who really who really cares. Well, that's what Vinny does, right? I mean, that's that's his mo. Yeah. Well, you know, he's just he's just super savvy in a cagey kind of way. I mean, he you know people." Uh, look at a Vinny or listen to a Vinny and, you know, and feel like, you know, there's no substance there. I can get over on this guy, but you can't because Vinny's really got all the angles covered. He's just not showing his hand. Well, he's also still kind of new, right? I mean, at least in the movies, brand new. So he makes those typical novice mistakes and he learns as he goes. He certainly does. Yeah. He pays quite a price. He, uh, yeah, I think exactly. he takes three, uh, Three trips, three trips to jail for um, right. uh, contempt of court. Yeah. Well, he's just he's just such a natural, and yeah, I mean, it kind of shows you know people underestimate him because he comes off as just this, you know, gambone or whatever they're called, you know, uh -huh. whatever politically incorrect term. <laughs> uh -huh. But but there's there's just more to him, and you know, people just take people at face value. They can read people wrong, and that's that's you know that that actually works to his benefit because I think it puts people off off their game. They're not ready for him. Absolutely. Yeah, they can't. They don't anticipate what's coming. Underestimating. Yeah. yeah. He, he certainly un he was certainly underestimated in the, in that trial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, you know he's. Um, He's fun to write. Vinny and Lisa are just fun to write about. Um, um, you know, you asked me about my sense of humor. It's like I just enjoy their dialogue. You know, there are certain, even if it's not comedy, there are certain classic um, tete a tete, that's the right word, um, you know, um, conversations, you know, like Hannibal Lecter and Starling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you just enjoy reading that, you know, just the cleverness of the the repartee and just the the chemistry, like you know, yeah, it's just the chemistry between them, right? That comes through every part. Yeah, Sorry, so I just Carol. I just enjoy you know putting them in situations where there's you know something for them to snipe about, you know, in their you know their sweet little way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we all really enjoyed this, but um, do you want to tell our uh, viewers about your other series and stuff so they can find out what else is going on and what else they might like? If they if they enjoyed this, what, do you, what of your other books would you recommend? Chalisi, the one you have on your website. Okay, well, <clears throat> I feel I would be remiss if I didn't uh, I didn't pump my, uh, my latest release, and that's Into the Groove, which is a new series um, that was released about, a, about 10 days ago first book. Um, this is a, a fictionalized account of the Palm Sunday Massacre that took place in Brooklyn, New York in 1984. It was at the time the, um, the most horrendous uh, mass murder in New York City history. And I had the, um, the, the honor of meeting a retired cop who at the time of this massacre had arrested um, this fellow Christopher Thomas, I couldn't remember his name, <laughs> who was accused, sentenced, and ultimately did 34 years prison time for murdering 10 women and kids. Um, and this cop was 100% sure that Sky didn't do it. So what this book is about, um, it's an alternate theory on what really happened. And there were a lot of people, a lot of powerful players involved who had an interest in getting finding a scapegoat and putting the matter to bed. Um, it involved um, um, Paul Castellano, who was the Don of all Dons in New York City, uh, John Gotti and his brother Gene, mm -hmm. um, Police Commissioner Benjamin Ward, 
uh, Mayor Koch, there were several people who had something to gain by putting a, an innocent man in prison. And that's the story of Into the Groove. Um, it features a new character, a new, new hero, uh, making his first appearance. Uh, his name is Steady Groove. Uh, it's short for Stedman Groove. Oh. And um, he's a rookie parole officer. And he's out there trying to defend his best buddy, who's a real street urchin, and has just been um, uh, arrested and is being tried uh, for the mass murder on Palm Sunday. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. So can we ask you that, so the person that was incarcerated and spent 34 years, was he ultimately exonerated or did he die in prison or what happened? He or can you not tell us that? Because oh, I can't, I can't tell you that because okay. it's completely changed in the book. Um, you know, the book is a completely fictionalized account. But the person who did 34 years was released in 2017 or 2018. Wow. Um, he maintained his innocence the entire time. Um, he was not a person who was able to represent well for himself. Um, he had psychiatric issues. Mm. And for some reason, it was just they just let him sit in prison and he was just, you know, he just did his time. Was he on the periphery of it at all? Like, did, um, <clears throat> I want to look this up now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What do you mean? Is he, did he, was he, was he periphery? involved? Was he involved? Was he just like some guy they randomly pulled in or was he involved in some way? Oh no, there was definitely, he was definitely tied in, into the situation. Um, he was in the, uh, he was at the murder scene prior to the shootings. He was there doing a drug deal. I mean, there were a lot of good reasons to, you know, not a, not a good reason, but a lot of reasons for a prosecutor to say he was there, he was doing a drug deal, he's a three-time loser. A lot of reasons for them to say, you know, this is an ideal patsy. Um, hmm. but well, it was interesting in, in Back to Brooklyn how the, um, you know, the the deputy mayor's <laughs> brother, all that, you know, I mean, you you kind of got some of that stuff involved in there too, which I thought was interesting because, you know, that's, you know, powerful people. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, when you, now that you've brought that up, there was one thing <laughs> that, um, that Dale did mention and Dale didn't like the idea of, of conspiracy and that element in back to Brooklyn is a peaks at conspiracy. Um, but, um, you know, when I write, um, and this is not so much true in, in the screenplay, My Cousin Vinny, I'm always looking for a twist ending. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, you know, it was a surprise when we found out that there were, in fact, two, <laughs> two, um, two identical sets of boys. But that's what Vinny was maintaining throughout the entire trial. Um, so I was going for more of a twist twist in my story you know and that's why we um, we drag the uh is the um lieutenant lieutenant mayor the not um, assistant mayor whatever his term deputy. title was deputy yeah. then we, <laughs> we tied the deputy mayor into the uh into the process well i think it, it was a good thing to do too to raise the stakes like you know he's such a newbie and yet they're going to have the actual district attorney trying this case where usually it's an, an assistant you know so he was right up against some big you know heavy heavy hitters and he's still relatively new and um so yeah it was kind of yeah well that was that was that was the challenge that you know I, I saw early on in writing that book is that you know he had such a massive success uh liberating his you know his cousin bill and uh andrew rothenstein from <laughs> the mur murder trial in alabama i had to come with something was you know equally if not more uh, weighty or, you know, consequential. It had to be a very important trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. yeah. Good. You mentioned in Alice books that um, you were amazed at the connection between the mob and the police in right. the 1980s. Do you think that's changed any? I certainly hope it has. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to get sued or anything. But. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, didn't they kind of help clean up New York? I mean, I've heard things about they were hired thugs to throw people out of buildings and all kinds of stuff. I don't know if that's true or not. but I don't know about hired thugs and throwing people out of windows, but 
<laughs> well, not out of windows, but like like moving drug addicts out of properties so that they could be cleaned up and stuff, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cleaning up the city, yeah. I mean, what I do know is, you know, is that the 1980s New York um, mm -hmm. was a mess. Um, it was the murder capital of the world. The cocaine gangs were running New York City. They were shooting cops. Um, it was just, it was just total anarchy. And um, I know, you know, you kind of pointed a, a jab at Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, but he is the man responsible for cleaning up. Yeah the mob and, you know, ultimately getting rid of all the uh, ridiculous crime in, in New York City. So, you know, Kudos pluses, to you. pluses and minuses. He, he, has, <laughs> More on just he had his ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, for the marbles went away. Uh, yeah. So we have a giveaway, right, that's going for a few days or how? When? what's the giveaway? Yeah, so it's pinned to the top of our Facebook page, three copies of Back to Brooklyn. So uh, comment there for a chance to win. Um, why don't we pick, do we want to give it a couple days? Uh, like yeah, oh, yeah. Wrong book. Sorry. This one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get, so today's, uh, what is today? Sunday. So how about like, uh, what do you think, Wednesday? Wednesday. Come Wednesday. back Wednesday and, we'll, and uh, pick the winners, Larry. Absolutely. Okay. And post so them on that thread. Hmm? Yeah, why did they rebrand your covers and and they renumbered them also, didn't they? Mm, no. Um, what did they? It was number one, I think. The first in what? the Mike and Vinny series. Is that number one? Under this covers. And then it looked like it had my cousin Vinny as number one under the rebranded re covers. Or at least that's what I thought I saw. It, it's the way it should be. Um, you know, when I when I started writing the series, we were just so hell bent on getting making you know getting the sequel out there, giving people a, a you know a story. This is what happened to Vinnie Lisa after they left Alabama. So if we had um, put a little bit more common sense to it, we probably would have shelved it for a year and released the novelization first. Mm -hmm. um, so now that we've rebranded with the fresh covers. We've put it back, put it back in the proper sequence. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will there be and more, please? Will there be more? <laughs> we we will see. We will see. I would love to do more. I would love to read more. Yeah, I, I, that's very inter very entertaining. So, what's next for you, for sure? Uh, what am I working on next? Well, um, I have a short story that'll be out in the. Um, uh, the Triads um, Anthology in October. Are you in that also, Diane? You're not? Okay. What, but you were... That? So that's the Charlotte uh, group? No. No? Um, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, oh, you're, the, the Triangle Sisters of Crime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the Triangle or the Triad? Because isn't the Triad no, Charlotte? Yeah, I just didn't have time to write anything for that, the rock and roll one. Yeah. Okay. I time to submit I, I had wanted to but it just came too close to a deadline but you were a judge for that weren't you i was yeah yeah okay so i have you to thank for my uh my <laughs> contribution so that'll be in october um i have a couple of books that are finished um one is in a really new character and you know you um you mentioned teresa um from from back to brooklyn well uh, I've taken her, and she's not the pivotal character in a new series, but she's her sister, Gina Marie Katati, <laughs> is a is a PI in a new series that um, that I I've just completed the first book on. So I guess we're looking for that sometime in 2023. Fine. Makes me think of uh, Joey from Friends, all of his Italian sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she, you know, she's Gina Marie is. Uh, is also a funny gal. Um, she's sort of like a, a Lisa Vito meets Stephanie Plum. Mm. <laughs> so look for that kind of humor. Yeah, that's fun, pretty fun. Fun. Okay, so they can people can find you at lawrencekelter.com. You're on Instagram, Facebook. On all those good places. Although I have to say, I spend most of my time on Facebook. Um, I can never figure out Twitter. <laughs> Instagram is also mysterious to me, but uh, I'm, I have some presence on there. Yeah. I would say most of most of us don't really do a lot of Twitter here in this particular group, but put your con your Facebook page and your website and stuff in the comments if you would, so people can find you. Sure. 
I will and do it. Thank you so much for being with us, especially knowing that you're COVID sick, COVID yeah. recovering. Well, I'm recovering. Yeah. Yeah. Is your wife sick? No, 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 no. I've been quarantined upstairs for the last week. Yeah. Oh. Well. well, at least you got to see her in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to do a comment. How do I do a comment? Um, when we close out, you'll be able to find it on the Facebook page. Just oh, okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Really All right. Well, thanks, everybody. <laughs> and uh, make sure to comment so that you can have a chance to win one of the signed copies of Back to Brooklyn. Thank you, Larry. Thank on you. The post for the, that's for the giveaway. It's it's pinned to the top of the page right now. So. Yeah. All okay. right. Have Good a great evening. Thank Bye, you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.